So let's talk now about subsurface fluids. To have diagenetic process, we know we need to have fluids. So what happens in terms of fluid in the subsurface? So, of course, we all think about oil, but there's also a hell of a lot of water that circulates in the subsurface. So how do you circulate fluids in the subsurface? In other words, what are potential pumps for fluids in the subsurface? One potential pump is compaction-driven fluid flow. We've seen in our previous class that if you load a water-laden sediment with sediments, you will tend to compact it. And of course, that means that you need to dewater it and move that water somewhere else. So that water would typically move laterally in the reservoir and could move up along your bedding all the way up to a carbonate. And then you could have this as a site for diagenetic transformation. Another well-known mechanism that can explain fluid flow in the subsurface is tectonic-driven fluid flow. If you have a tectonic event, a, the collision between two plates, for instance, you can imagine that the force of this collision is likely to squeeze sediment and water within the sediment and generate large-scale circulation of fluid all the way through some limestone and thus generate some diagenetic transformation. Another potential mechanism is thermal convection fluid flow. So just like we've seen for the isolated platform, if you have a series of fractures that are deeply rooted and go all the way to the basement, the basement is very hot thanks to the geothermal gradient, those fluids will be heated, the hot fluid will then come up the fracture, will cool down and then essentially sink again to be reheated and that creates those convection zones of uh, fluid flow and that fluid can circulate through limestone and again generate a front of diagenesis. And finally, we can have topography-driven fluid flow. That's when we have a high topography that is recharged with meteoric fluid. That fluid then goes down and the pressure of the water column, the, the water head, is what pushes the fluid at depths laterally away from the reservoir because they have to make space for the new fluid coming in. And this hotter, more brilliant fluids then move up into the following the, the bedding. And again, if they encounter limestone, diagenetic processes can happen. So what type of diagenetic process can happen? Well, let's look at the composition of the subsurface fluids. So most of the subsurface fluids are actually more saline than marine water. As you can see, we have brackish water is only 26% of the reservoir. Saline water that are at or above sea level represents 44% of, uh, of the subsurface brines. And proper brines, which have salinities well above seawater, represent a significant portion of these um, subsurface fluids. So in fact, more than 50% more than of the subsurface fluids are very saline. Very saline implies that there is a, a large quantity of magnesium, like we've seen in, in the uh, subsurface and hydrothermal fluid uh, for diagenesis. And that means, of course, that one thing that these subsurface fluids can do is lead to dolomitization. So subsurface dolomitization is not rare, and that's exactly what we see in the cliffs behind me. We have subsurface fracture-related dolomitization. So let's look in detail at this study that we've done on uh, Wadi Sartan. I'm showing you here a picture with the, uh, the distribution of the limestone, which is blue, the early dolomite, which appears right here at the top, it has a grayish, brownish color. And then at this location, the late dolomite is extremely easy to spot. And you can see we have some chimneys here that look like fractures, but also we have some kind of an interesting shape, really, because they look more like cavities than they look like fractures. And when we studied those, my PhD student, Julia Becker, studied those. She looked at the dimension and the aspect ratio of these uh, dolomite bodies, those late dolomite bodies. We know that they're iron rich. We know that they contain saddle dolomite. So again, that's indication that they represent a late stage warm fluid diagenesis front. And 
What she also saw, which was quite interesting, is that this late diagenesis, when you go away from the main cavity, seems to be following bedding and stylolite suture. So it seems that the bedding planes and the stylolites themselves were conduit for this late burial fluid. And so we have a little bit of dolomitization around these planes, even away from the main zone of late stage dolomite. We also find those interesting textures at the outcrop. Those are known as zebra dolomite. And zebra dolomite is essentially a, an expansion, a mineral expansion of dolomite filling cracks and growing laterally. And that zebra texture, again, is really typical for late stage dolomite, for hydrothermal dolomite. And here we have a beautiful example of, of zebras. If you look at the detail, it's always more complicated, but you can see the early dolomite here at the bottom. So that's a reflux style dolomite dating from the Permian. And then you can see the late dolomite and you can, you can now know and see that this late dolomite forms the saddle structure that I was talking about. So we have saddle dolomite in this case, a really indication of late stage cementation or late stage diagenesis. We also notice that there's a lot of fabric if we look at those sites of dolomitization. So for instance, we have class that are dolomitized within a limestone matrix. So it seems that some of the component of the rocks were preferentially dolomitized. And some of those class are actually distributed not randomly, but along chimneys that look very much like karstic cavities. And so we very quickly came with the conclusion that we're looking at something that is related to a paleocarst that was then further dolomitized much later in the history of the rock by hot fluid, probably during the formation of the Oman Mountain or emplacement of the Ophiolites. So our model for the dolomite here at Wadi Sartan is that we have in, uh, in the Permian deposition of limestone followed by a dolomitization. And here we capture the front of that early dolomite at Wadi Sartan. This is then followed by exposure during the Permian and early fracture and karstification as we have seen for the Guadalupian of Texas in the previous class. But then these um, cavities basically keep growing as we have multiple exposures and during burial, we have then a zone that has more permeability than the surrounding rock and that is used by the hot fluid that circulate along fractures and counter this paleocarstic network and then flood the paleocarst network and thus form this nice um, iron rich dolomite zones that still capture the, the essentially the geometry of a karst at the outcrop. So let's focus a little bit on the fluid now and talk about stable isotopes in the subsurface. So when we go in the subsurface, at first, because temperature increases, we will have a tendency of having delta 18 that are progressively lighter. So here's an example of Jurassic calcite cement. And you can see that as we go from 40 degree to 100 degree, the net effect on the isotope is to shift the delta 18 of the calcite towards lighter values, which is, which is effectively capturing the temperature at which these minerals are formed. However, after a certain point, we start to see the advection of more and more of the heavy brine from the subsurface. And these brines are heavy because A, they're evaporated and B, they've been in contact with classic rocks. So then they will tend to basically bring the delta 18 of the calcite back to more heavy values just because of the composition of the fluid. And at the same time, we often have carbon generated by the cracking of organic matter that is mixed with these new fluids. So the delta C13 of those cement will tend to become progressively more negative. And that's the impact of this CO2 that comes from the late stage cracking of organics and oil formation and things like that.